welcome to Angus for this talk. Uh, Angus has been with the Society now for three or four years, certainly helping with or produced the ICARA book, uh, which has been a, a great achievement by the Society amongst other things. So I'll hand over to Angus. Thank you very much. On 16 July 1945, the first test detonation of an implosion type atomic device was undertaken at Alamogordo, New Mexico, at the conclusion of the wartime Manhattan Project. The following month, nuclear weapons were detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki on 6 and 9 August, respectively, leading to Japan's surrender and the end of the Second World War. Just seven days after the second de detonation, a proposal to test nuclear weapons against warships was made by Lewis Strauss, future chair of the Atomic Energy Commission. This set in chain a wide ranging debate amongst the senior ranks of America's political, military and atomic science leadership regarding the future of the bomb with numerous questions to be considered. Included amongst these topics was the issue as to whether further testing should be necessary and if so, what were its primary objectives? From the outset, there were two conflicting philosophical views on testing. Strauss regarded the naval testing as a means of evaluating survivability. By contrast, Senator Brian McMahon, the subsequent author of the Atomic Energy Act, believed that testing should concentrate on the vulnerability of ships to nuclear attack. Fueling these and other related arguments was the existing rivalry between the Army and the Navy, with an independent US Air Force not to be formed until 1947. The USN got in first, and on 27 October, Admiral Ernest J. King publicly announced that the Navy would conduct an atomic test. After more discussions, it was determined that the test be a joint Army-Navy project. On 11 January 1946, President Truman appointed Admiral William H. Blandy as the commander of what was to be designated as Army-Navy Joint Task Force 1. The selection of Blandy as operational commander of JTF-1 was not without controversy. His directorship of the Bureau of Naval Ordnance from 1941 to 1943 had been severely criticised with respect to the constant failure of the early American wartime torpedoes carried by submarines and aircraft and the apparent refusal of the Bureau to take effective remedial action. Blandy was regarded as a tough, no-nonsense operator which he demonstrated when assigned command of the pre-invasion bombardment of Iwo Jima. His attitude towards the conduct of the atomic tests was that they were essentially an extension of recent wartime operations. This produced what one expert medical commentator referred to as, quote, a blind, hairy-chested approach to radiological safety. Adding to the discussion regarding the tests was a fear among senior members of the naval staff that a repeat of the aerial bombing tests undertaken by Colonel Billy Mitchell in the early 1920s would again embarrass the Navy. The Army was insistent that all the target vessels be equipped as if they were in an operational setting, including the stowage of full loads of fuel oil and live ammunition, a demand which Blandy rejected on the grounds that the sinking of such vessels by secondary means would compromise the analysis of test effects. In order to assure the American public that the experiments were objective as possible. President Truman established an independent civilian evaluation board to complement the military post-test evaluations. Blandy set, settled on the choice of Bikini Atoll as a suitable test site, primarily because of its isolation, particularly from the continental United States, stable weather patterns and a large protected anchorage. In spite of its strategic location at the northeastern periphery of the Marshall Group, the Japanese had done little more than establish an observation post at the atoll during the Second World War. Having assumed control of the Marshalls in January 1946, the United States government determined to relocate the local inhabitants once the site had been chosen. Persuaded that the sacrifice of their homes was necessary for the advancement of world peace, in March, the islanders were conveyed to Rongerik Atoll, which was unsuitable for habitation because of a lack of food supplies. Several other relocations were performed over the following years, during which time the Marshallese suffered badly from malnutrition. 
an attempted return to Bikini in 1975 was aborted due to the excessive residual contamination, with much of the remaining population residing today on Keeley Island or relocated to the islands beyond the Marshalls Group. The size of a wartime invasion fleet, JTF-1 was required to be as self-sufficient as possible, given the atoll's isolation and lack of an airstrip. In order to maintain manning levels, thousands of sailors and other personnel agreeing to having, agreed to having their wartime mobilisation terms extended. Preparation of the site commenced in 1946, with Navy Seabees and US Army engineers blasting a number of holes in the outer reef to allow for easier access. Related construction was also undertaken at Kwajalein and Eni Wita to permit the use of the former Japanese bases and airfields by the United States Army Air Force and United States Navy Air Units, along with the headquarters and administrative facilities. Once the preliminary clearing tests had been carried out, an enormous array of test equipment was installed. This included a wide variety of the most sophisticated photographic means then available. As the visual documentation of the Japanese detonations was deemed to be too limited for diagnostic purposes. When the two shots were fired, all personnel were evacuated aboard ship to a seaward position some 10 nautical miles from the, to the east of the atoll. Shot Abel was executed with an implosion type device nicknamed Gilda. The bomb was dropped from a B-29 bomber, Dave's Dream, belonging to the United States Army Air Force's 509th Bombardment Group. As well as sinking five ships, numerous others were damaged, some of these being set afire. Due to the low altitude of the airburst, the funnel of the mushroom cloud impacted the surface of the lagoon, which, upon, which along with the force of the blast resulted in lagoon waters becoming contaminated. Press observers were left disappointed by the apparent lack of observable damage and the effects of the explosion itself, with some correspondents noting that the sound of the explosion was akin to a low pop, while others compared it to about a flatulence. One newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, argued that the outcome of the shot proved that the weapon's power had been greatly exaggerated by internationalists, critics who were seeking its global abolition. In spite of good flying conditions and the target ship USS Nevada being painted bright orange, the bomb missed its mark by 649 metres. Subsequent investigations failed to pinpoint the reason for such a substantial miss, although aircrew error was believed to be the most likely cause. Nevertheless, the damage inflicted was severe enough upon all ships within the indicated circular radius of 1,000 metres. Most of the ships were carrying sample quantities, quantities of supplies, fuel and ammunition, and one of these, the carrier USS Saratoga, Ship 10, which was positioned approximately one mile from the detonation point, caught fire. It was concluded in subsequent studies that the positioning of the individual target ships, bow or broadside on, dictated the amount of damage received, with the latter position being the most vulnerable in this respect. The detonation of Shot Baker proved to provided some of the most iconic images of the nuclear age. Instead of the formation of a mushroom cloud, the detonation produced an enormous cauliflower shaped geyser. Its major feature was what became known as the base surge. This was a combination of undersea and surface level surge and spray caused by a giant gas bubble generated by the explosion and added to by huge columns of water and spray collapsing back into ground zero. The bubble produced an instant supersonic shockwave which pulverised the hulls of many of the target ships moored nearby. An estimated 2 million tonnes of seawater and sand were lifted into the column, obscured for a few seconds by a fog-like formation known as a Wilson cloud. They described as tsunami-like, the propagation of the base surge was more akin to a pyroclastic flow 
emanating from a volcanic eruption. However, the return of the lagoon water to the space left vacant by the bubble did generate a large tsunami reaching 94 metres in height, some 300 metres from ground zero, 11 seconds after the detonation, and eventually creating a multi-wave shore break on the nearby islands measured at five metres. All target ships within the indicated 1,000 metre circular radius were sunk or incurred heavy structural damage, while a number of others located beyond it suffered a similar fate. The damage occasioned by Shot Baker was generally more extensive than that produced by the air pressure emanating from Abel due to the greater power produced by the underwater shock wave. In spite of the incredible visual evidence obtained, Shot Baker, like Shot Abel, suffered from the same vices as the bomber versus battleship experiments conducted by Mitchell over 40 years beforehand. By mooring the target ships in pre-planned formations, an accurate simulation could be made of the effects of a nuclear strike upon a crowded naval anchorage such as Pearl Harbor. But equally, no proper evaluation was available regarding the impact upon a task force at sea, especially when considering the varying dispositions of such a force when steaming and manoeuvring in an operational setting. In the aftermath of both tests, decontamination procedures, procedures were attempted. Remote control boats were sent into the lagoon first to ascertain radio, radiation levels, and thereafter boarding parties were deployed aboard various ships to scrub down or sandblast paintwork, while Navy fire boats attempted to bring fires aboard some of the damaged ships under control. The entirety of the decontamination process was a failure. Numerous irradiated vessels had to be towed back to the United States, where they were subsequently scrapped or sunk at sea. Most of the sailors detailed for decontamination duty were not equipped with film badges, protective coveralls, gloves, booties or gas masks. In subsequent research, it was concluded that the mortality rate amongst the personnel was increased by 5.7 per cent, equating to some 2,166 USN participants of the approximately 38,000 present for the tests. Yet in spite of numerous incidences of immediate sickness, most particularly vomiting and extreme nausea amongst the affected sailors, Admiral Blandy refused to suspend decontamination operations until 10 August. The cleanup was only suspended on this date when he received unquestionable evidence from the army medical e experts that the effects of plutonium residue could not be detected by Geiger counters. Test animals placed aboard the ships within the blast zones were either killed outright or died of radiation exposure within a matter of days. As a result of the widespread contamination and the failure of remedial measures, a decision was taken to cancel the scheduled third shot, Charlie, which was due to be detonated in deep water to the east of the Atlantic. Officially, the tests were reported to be a success with no casualties beyond minor injuries incurred. However, the findings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Evaluation Board regarding the effects of radioactive contamination were seemingly overlooked by the press and the public at large. Results obtained from the study of test animals proved that heavy armour shielding provided only limited protection against exposure. From an operational perspective, it was clearly established that any type of vessel caught on the surface within a radius of several miles from an airburst or underwater detonation point was vulnerable to the effects of nuclear blast and that distances up to at least a mile, the levels of emitted radiation made human survival highly unlikely. What the Crossroad series instead achieved in large measure was the demystifying of the power of the atomic bomb in the minds of the American public. This dread of the ultimate weapon was steadily replaced by what one prominent com commentator, the journalist Norman Cousins, described as the standardisation of catastrophe, a source of power to be developed, stockpiled and administered in the realms of routine. Far from becoming the catalyst for scrapping the United States Navy, as had been envisaged by some within the debate prior to the tests, tactical nuclear weapons were to be seamlessly incorporated within the Navy's existing operational practices and procedures.
The next nuclear test to involve a warship as a target was the first atomic explosion performed by Great Britain. The British considered themselves vulnerable to an attack carried out by a means of a smuggle bomb inside the hull of a freighter located within a home port. As such, the experimental weapon was to be detonated within the hull of the frigate HMS Plym, so as to measure its effects in relation to the planned scenario. The preparations were extremely rushed, with canisters of plutonium forwarded to from the windscale reactor in the boot of the taxi, exploded in the Montebello Islands off Western Australia on 3 October 1952. The blast almost entirely vaporised the plim, in essence pr producing a dirty bomb with extensive localised fallout. Similar to the conduct of crossroads, the safety procedures adopted by the British planners were haphazard at best. Following the three successful tests conducted under Operation Sandstone at Eniwetok Atoll in 1948, fundamental changes to the design of the atomic cores led to the mass production of nuclear arms as well as the development of weapons for specific military tasks. Undertaken in May 1955, Operation Wigwam became the first occasion for the detonation of a navalised nuclear device in the form of the Mark 90 depth bomb. Under the command of Rear Admiral John Sylvester, 30 ships belonging to Task Force 7.3 proceeded in early May 1955 to a position approximately 500 miles to the southwest of San Diego. The central purpose of the shot was to determine the effectiveness of a deeply de detonated nuclear weapon upon a submarine. The conduct of the test revolved around several towed arrays involving barges and tugs, which sustained, which sustained some damage from adverse seas in the days preceding the event. Suspended from these barges was the Mark 90 and three specially constructed three-quarter scale replicas of a tank class submarine minus the conning tower. Equipped with a variety of cameras and other measuring equipment, the models were positioned at various depths to record shockwave effects, while the bomb itself was to be the deepest underwater nuclear explosion executed by the United States. The firing of the weapon on 14 May produced a spectacular localised upsurge of sea and spray, but no central column, as had been the case with the Baker shot. One of the Tang miniatures was destroyed outright and another damaged, while the underwater acoustic output travelled up to 20,000 kilometres by way of a round trip between distant hydrophone detection stations and ground zero. Otherwise, valuable information was obtained as to the ranges at which nuclear weapons could be safely fired against enemy submarines, but at a significant cost. A larger than expected radius of spray residue impacted a number of ships, including the vessel with the mission scientists aboard. Radiation exposure amongst the affected crews resulted in a number of premature deaths, with survivors eventually being compensated decades later by a general's fund established for test veterans after several lawsuits in the United States. As can be observed by the footage, part of the towed array is in front centre of the camera. In this shot, the primary barge housing the Mark 90 bomb can be seen uh, in the middle of the explosion.
Soviets commenced a series of naval effects tests in 1958, several of which involved the firing of live nuclear-tipped torpedoes from submarines. Like the Americans, the Soviets in the pre-Sputnik era had envisaged attacking enemy ports with high-yield weapons conveyed by torpedo. However, the T-15 torpedo project conducted with this objective in mind proved to be a failure. Central to the success of the following test was the performance of the new T-5 torpedo, which was to become embroiled in one of the most serious incidents during the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. On its deployment to the Caribbean to shadow American ships in participating, participating in the blockade of Cuba, the submarine B-59 was targeted by destroyers, which dropped practice depth charges as a warning for the boat to, sub, to surface and identify itself. Unbeknown to the Americans, the Soviet submarine commanders were under direct orders from Moscow to retaliate to any attack with their singular nuclear-tipped T-5 weapons. Out of contact with its home base for several days, the captain of the B-59 was convinced that he should retaliate, which was agreed to by the ship's political officer. It was fortunate, however, that the flotilla commander, who was using the boat as his flagship, disagreed and overrode the captain's wishes. This incident demonstrated one of the greatest hazards of deploying nuclear weapons at sea, namely the difficulty in real-time communication with ships and submarines in circumstances where pre-existing release orders had been issued, thus compromising the centralised command and control of the warheads, leading to the possibility of an accidental launch. This dilemma was explored in the Hollywood film The Bedford Incident in 1965, where the fictional American destroyer Bedford accidentally nukes a Soviet submarine it has been tracking and is immediately destroyed by a nuclear torpedo fired from a sub in retaliation. Subsequent dramatised <coughs> documentaries such as Countdown to Looking Glass, 1984, and BBC Special Report, 2016, have postulated the detonation of nuclear weapons at sea as the precursor to the initiation of an eventual general nuclear exchange between the superpowers. Operation Hardtack 1 was the first of two hardtack test series performed just prior to the imposition of a joint moratorium on nuclear testing agreed to by the United States, the Soviet Union and Britain. Consisting of some 35 detonations, Hardtack 1 was undertaken at Inuitak Atoll, while Hardtack 2 tested smaller weapon yields in Nevada. Two underwater test shots, Wahoo and Umbrella, were included in the program. The objectives of both tests were similar to Operation Wigwam three years before, but with some notable changes. Improved instrumentation suspended from barges and a much greater emphasis upon radiological safety was incorporated. This included dose limits for those working aboard ships that were contaminated, the provision of proper protective clothing for all personnel involved, the incorporation of a new, newly developed spray system aboard a drone target ship, and a floating decontamination facility used by one of the mission support vessels. The umbrella shot was in part designed to evaluate the effectiveness of a nuclear blast in clearing minefields with a number of inert mines laid in the target zone. The Wahoo shot was de detonated on 16 May 1958 near Pocon Island, but outside of the Inuitak Lagoon. The target ships to be used for the this program consisted of three destroyers, a single submarine, a scale submersible used in the wigwam tests, and a merchant freighter. Major difficulties with currents and anchoring caused issues with the effectiveness of test measurements. In spite of a spray dome and water columns reaching an altitude of 260 metres, damage to the target ships was minimal, as was contamination beyond the immediate vicinity of the zero point. 
The base surge lasted for approximately three to five minutes and spread out to a radius of 6,000 metres. From the readings taken, it was confirmed that the surge has been, has had been the case in the previous tests, was the most radioactive element of an underwater explosion. The umbrella shot was conducted on June 9 in shallow water within the Inuitak Lagoon, again in the vicinity of Pocon Island. On this occasion, the central column of the explosion reached 1,500 metres, with the base surge extending from 1,800 to 3,000 metres. Radiation beyond that conveyed by the base surge was again negligible. A large crater some 3,000 metres in diameter was created by the shallow water blast. One of the key findings revealed that underwater nuclear detonations created less fallout due to the absorption of radioactive material in the water and vaporized droplets. Direct gamma radiation was found to be extremely low and the much higher readings from the base surge largely dissipated within 30 minutes of the device being fired. In both shots, the norm nominal yield of the weapons were below 10 kilotons. Moscow's decision to recommence nuclear testing in August 1961 was responded to by Washington with the undertaking of Operation Dominic, a series of 31 tests at the Pacific Proving Grounds, with some of the activities extending into the period of the Cuban Missile Crisis, much to the discomfort of the White House. This was be the last set of atmospheric detonations performed by the United States prior to the signing of the Parcel Test Ban Treaty in 1963. Unlike all prior naval effects tests, Shot Swordfish was to be conducted under operational conditions as a means of proving the new ASROC anti-submarine warfare system equipped with the W-44 atomic depth charge. Like Wigwam, the event, the event took place in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California, with several destroyers and an aircraft carrier in attendance in order to simulate an ASW attack. Launched from the destroyer U USS Algaholm, the ASROC travelled some 3,976 metres away before descending to a depth of 198 metres prior to detonation. The effects of the blast were not dissimilar from the Wahoo event, with only minimal radiation recorded although the yield produced was possibly as high as 20 kilotons. From the footage of the test, the positioning of the warships can be observed in relation to the explosion, thereby mimicking their potential disposition in the event of an ASW confrontation. Swordfish marked the final occasion on which naval effects tests were conducted in the atmosphere or underwater, with all testing by the US and the USSR being moved underground thereafter. At the time of the swordfish test, a new competitor for ASROC in the ASW domain was undergoing the first stages of its trials in Australia. With twice the range of an ASROC, the ICARA system was arguably the most effective nuclear capable ASW delivery platform of the Cold War era, thanks to its in-flight communication system, known as XDAC, which permitted the weapon to remain under the control of the launching ship until the attached homing torpedo was released over the target submarine thus allowing for the controlled downing of the missile in the event of an accidental launch. In the original specifications for an export version of the ICARA to be supplied to the Royal Navy, the British had insisted that the system be dual capable, and though this requirement was later removed, the RNIK, as it became known, retained a nuclear capability with some further modifications. With the partial test ban in effect, 
nuclear explosions in the atmosphere or underwater were simulated by the use of high explosives. By placing ships close to the source of a pile containing 500 tonnes of TNT, the blast effects of a one kiloton detonation could be reproduced. Two series of experiments were scheduled for late 1964 and 1965, utilising proving ranges at San Clemente, California, and Smuggler's Cove, Hawaii, respectively. Seven ships of varying ages, one of them from the Royal Canadian Navy, was selected to participate. The main target ship was the recommissioned World War II light cruiser USS Atlanta. The vessel was cut down to deck level and destroyer systems for communication, detection, fire control and weapons delivery were installed and an experimental reinforced fiberglass deck house was constructed for the comparison with aluminium designs. Unlike the nuclear tests, all of the vessels would be manned. Creating high quality cast blocks from materials recovered from old torpedoes, mines and other weapons the Naval Powder Factory assembled a total of 92,022 blocks for the explosions, assembled into beehive shaped hemispheres, thus reaching a pile height of five metres. Employing two small, smaller 20 tonne underground piles, the blast effects of the Alpha tests at San Clemente were negligible. As the ship carrying the majority of the test structures and recording equipment, Atlanta was moored closest to ground zero. The three shots in Hawaii were performed in February, April and June 1965. On each occasion, the crew and observers aboard the Atlanta were kept aboard during the explosions for safety reasons. The effects upon unexposed equipment were considerable. The SPS-37 and SPS-10 antennas, as well as the URD-4 Radio direction finder were torn off by the blast, while other structures were severely deformed. The Tata guard of missile radar was placed out of operation for one hour, and damage was inflicted upon the ASROC launcher and torpedo tubes. However, the weapons themselves escaped unscathed. The tripod mast carrying electronics gear was destroyed, while the entire DLG 16 deck house between two levels was blown in. Minus the hazard of fission products, a comprehensive appraisal of battle damage to ship systems from a nuclear detonation was obtained, with the blast creating an overpressure of 10 PSI, which hit the Atlanta, an equivalent of a one megaton detonation some 2,400 metres away. In summary, the dedicated nuclear naval effects tests, with the notable exception of operations crossroads, were generally successful given the high volume and wide variety of accurate data amassed. It is also noteworthy that none of the effects tests involved the use of thermonuclear devices. The Abel and Baker shots undertaken in Operation Crossroads were, however, only instructive from the perspective of how not to conduct nuclear tests poorly arranged with limited attention paid to safety. Both of these explosions demonstrated the extreme danger inherent in all such offence, most particularly the lethal hazards of emitted radiation. Progress in rectifying some deficiencies proved to be slow, as illustrated in the wigwam test some nine years later, in spite of additional lessons learned via test activities in Nevada during the intervening period. From this perspective of radiological hazard, the swordfish shot proved to be the cleanest of the detonations in spite of its 20 kiloton yield being the equivalent of the Abel and Baker firings. Results obtained in Sailor Hat proved that the detonation of actual nuclear devices was not required for effective da damage evaluation. Nevertheless, the underwater shots in particular did advance scientific knowledge of the behaviour of shock waves and other subsurface activity, which has been otherwise utilised in various important fields of military and civilian scientific study. Most evident of all was the fact that nuclear munitions have transformed naval warfare in a manner that escalated to destruction to previously unimaginable levels, and in doing so, helped ensure that no such conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union was ever initiated. It is sobering to note, however, that both the United States 
and the People's Republic of China both possess a range of naval and or navalised weapon systems which are dual capable, thereby maintaining the risk of a nuclear confrontation at sea in the event of hostilities between both nations within the foreseeable future. Angus, that was the most sobering presentation I think I've ever been part of in my whole life. And thank heavens we're still here. <laughs>